<coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, for, you, for those of you who are here the last time, not here, but at Kona, I was uh, the bartender there, so I hope <coughs> everyone was happy about the drinks. Um, I am not a bartender, though. <laughs> I am a front-end developer at Kona, um, and I've been there for like a year now, and before that I did full-stack development, so, uh, but I, I fell in love with the front-end, and I'm very passionate about it, uh, thus bringing me to this talk um, about what we can do with, the, with web components here today. Um, side note, I drink way too much coffee. I think that's like something we do in this, uh, in this field of work. Um, yeah, so uh, you can find me on Twitter at Insanity. I don't tweet that much, but uh, I do follow uh, a lot of people and I do read a lot on there, uh, spend way too much time in there. Um, right, and what I want to talk to you today about is um, web components and like, like how, what common problems uh, we have today, what do they solve, and then a little bit about you know, how, how are they made up, how, what is this web component spec and, and how does it fit into, uh, into, into how we work. Um, and then the flavor part in the title, that'll be like, how can you get started with the framework you use today? And this being in, in Geohoos, there will of course be something about Angular elements in there as well. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the things uh, here is that we don't, we don't want to rebuild components like for every framework out there or for every major wor version we get. Um, and we want to ship less bytes to users. And especially now with all these mobile devices, this is getting more and more important. And depending on where in the world you want to deploy your code, it's also equally important. And then of course, we want to stay productive. You know, no one wants to rewrite their code every day. It gets boring and it gets tedious uh, and it's not a lot of fun, right? Um, and one of these, uh, one of some of the current uh, problems uh, in, in this spectrum uh, is sort of like uh, what you call UI libraries, right? So uh, everyone has probably spent time with one of these, like a multi-select, this is a bootstrap one, but there are several kinds. Um, and one of the issues here is that if we look up on, on NPM, uh, this is just a search for multi-select, um, we get like 400 packages here. Uh, a lot of them, of course, uh, a lot of people build their own uh, packages, and that's pretty cool. Uh, open source is great. Um, but there are also a lot of wrappers, and there are a lot of versions in the different libraries, right? You have React versions, you have Vue, you have Angular, AngularJS, and what have you. Um, not looking into the frameworks, we used to do something like this before, right, back in the jQuery world. Um, we have our script, our arbitrary library. Uh, we have a select class in this example. Um, and then the script, right, where we find, where we find this element and we initialize our multi-select with uh, a few options. Um, and then we have our frameworks. Uh, maybe you've built some of these and maybe the framework has uh, like uh, an implementation of it already, or we can wrap the implementation from before, right? So this is uh, an Angular example, pretty basic example, um, where we have uh, in the ng after view init, we initialize this uh, multi-select on the native element. Um, a lot of these like uh, libraries out there, they do this where they wrap like either the older jQuery implementation or a, or a, or a vanilla JavaScript implementation. And that's all great, but say you have a React version and an Angular version, they might they might have implemented it, uh, implemented it differently. So if you come from Angular over to a React project and you're like, okay, this, this multi-selector is pretty cool, why can't I use that in React? Um, and then you find the version in React and it might not have the same like the same API or the same, might not even have the, have the same look and feel. Um, and this is actually true for, yeah, for several other libraries, right? Uh, the NPM example before, if you search for date pickers, uh, there's like 1300 results or something like that. I don't know who builds all these date pickers. I never built one. Um, and they're quite hard as well. Um, and, and to sort of get into this whole web component thing, wouldn't it be cooler if we could just do this, right? Just declare it in our HTML and we would have this multi-select and we wouldn't have to think about, you know, like how does this work with Angular? Or how does this work with React or Vue? We could just bind to it and just use it in our DOM. And this, this is where web components come in, right? Web components are sort of like an umbrella spec, so it covers uh, a few different low-level APIs. And we're gonna go through them just quickly here. Um, we have custom elements, we have HTML templates, and we have the shadow DOM. There used to be a fourth as well, but it's, uh, it's sort of died out, uh, so I'm not gonna go too much into that. 
But let's start off with the custom elements. This is really like the meat of web components. Um, they're actual HTML elements, meaning like the tag I showed you before, like the tags you're used to with your Angular components uh, directly in the DOM. Uh, it's actually these we're building with this custom element spec, right? They extend the default HTML element class just like every other built-in element you have in the browser. So like a paragraph would be an HTML paragraph element, I think it is. Um, which gives us a lot of a uh, lot of cool stuff like the whole DOM API query selector and and what have you. And then we get lifecycle elements like we're used to from say Angular or Vue, like our ng on init, our ng on destroy, um, and the equivalent ones in in, in Vue as well. And uh, just to have a look at, at at what this would look like, um, so here we have a class, and we're extending the built-in HTML element. Um, if we define a constructor, it's not required, but if we use a constructor, we have to call super. Uh, this is what wires up the whole DOM API and the HTML element. Um, then we have the connected callback, um, um, which, which gets called every time you put this DOM node in, uh, every time you put it in the DOM, your, uh, your component. So this, this would be where you like, you fetch your required resources, et cetera, to set up uh, event handlers uh, or, and render your components as well. Then we have the disconnected callback is where you do your cleanup. It's like the equivalent to ng on destroy, right? This is when your node gets taken out of the DOM again. The third one here on the screen, the attribute changed callback is a little, it's a little different, right? But this basically um, gets called every time an attribute on your element changes. Um, that could be a custom attribute you've, uh, you've put in yourself, but you could actually also listen on style and class if you wanted to do that. Um, and it only works for observed attributes. So if we have a static getter with an array, um, uh, we can define the attributes that we want to listen on. So this is like setting up the listeners, like using input in, in, in Angular uh, as an example. And then to, to wire it all up so the DOM understands it is, uh, we call this window custom elements define. Then we give it a string of our tag and there has to be a dash in there. Uh, it would complain otherwise. And that's because um, um, tag names without the dash are reserved like for the browsers, for the DOM, for whenever they introduce a new element or, or the likes. Um, and then we give it our class, meaning that then it knows that, okay, every time I find this tag in, in like in a DOM, when it goes through, then it knows it has to instantiate our class, right? Pretty much, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> the next one we have are HTML templates, not directly tied to this, but can, can be used outside as well. They're like HTML or DOM fragments. So, so they're pieces of HTML, they're pieces of DOM, but they're not actually rendered at first. Uh, nothing actually happens to them until we do something with them with, uh, with JavaScript, like cloning them, which is actually like incredibly performant. Uh, instead, of, uh, instead of just taking the element and then copying it in, then when we use clone node, um, um, it does it very performantly as well. It looks something like this, right? We have a template, we have an ID, and we have some content inside this template. Um, and this won't actually activate until we grab this template by ID and insert it into something else, right? So this is just uh, an empty, an empty uh, or to the DOM, it's just empty, right? Third one, and this is a big one as well. This one actually, I uh, think someone said that it sort of fixes DOM and CSS. <laughs> and that's a strong term, but it's isolated DOM, meaning that uh, we basically have like, if we had our component in, in a shadow DOM, then the outside world wouldn't know about it, right? Like the video player we have in, in, in the browsers, like, uh, like you've uh, probably seen before. It has scope CSS, and this, is, this one is a really big one, right? Because we have all these, we have it in Angular already, right? Where you can define the view encapsulation of your components, where you can say, you know, it's scoped. And then Angular, when it compiles, put on the, all these, uh, these attributes uh, to make your specificity on your CSS classes, you know, more specific so they, so they don't bleed out. But on the other hand, they don't actually um, stop the outside world's uh, CSS from, from penetrating your component and, and you know, affecting it. Uh, and this is where scope CSS is pretty cool because nothing bleeds out and nothing can penetrate it. Uh, and then someone might say, but what about if I want something to be changed. And that is not actually part of it right now. I know there are in talks about like a, like a parts spec, I think it is in the shadow room, where you can pretty much define like say, okay, this part of my shadow, uh, shadow elements here, you can style that and do something uh, with it. But I don't know how far they are with it, but it's coming. We get composition through the slot element. 
works a lot like ng content and slot in view, uh, aptly named the same thing, uh, meaning that when whatever we put in the tag uh, out in the DOM, we decide where we want to put that within our shadow DOM, like uh, within our template. That could be, uh, in the case of a multi-select, it could be the label, right? Like where do we want to place that? Or it could be all the options and we want to place them in like this drop down. Um, and by all this, we av avoid these naming conflicts that we usually get. Uh, you know, naming things is hard, and especially in CSS, this is why we've invented all these, all these ITCSS, BEM, stuff like that. It looks a little like this when we create uh, a shadow root. We have uh, an element, in this case, just a standard header, right? Um, and then we uh, attach the shadow to this, so we get this shadow root, which is actually a node just be beneath our, our other element. Um, and then we set the inner HTML of the shadow root, and then this uh, H1 here is actually hidden away from the outside world, meaning that you know styles from out there won't bleed in, uh, won't penetrate and do anything with, uh, with it. So all these three things combined um, give something like this, and I hope it's, uh, you're able to see it out there, right? Yeah. So we have our template, right? We have some styling in there, and we have uh, a div, uh, and uh, I know this is very simple, it's just to sort of keep it within this multi-select idea. Um, where we have our multi-select dropdown, and I've used the slot in there as well. We can name the slots, by the way, as well, just like we can with the ng-content, just as a side note. And then we have a script down here where we take our, we get our template right by query selecting it. Then we define our custom elements and multi-select here, and we're just doing it with an anonymous class in this example just to fit it on the screen. Um, and then in the constructor, we attach the shadow root, and we clone the node from our template. And that's pretty much it. Like this, this is a web component, and you could take this and and you can use our multi-select and uh, like directly in a DOM, and it would work. Uh, and of course, there's not much here, right? But you probably could have guessed that you need to set up like the event listeners, like for the click, and and for like looking for all these options that you put into uh, into this multi-select and handle all that logic in there, just like you would in an Angular component or in a view component. Um, so the key takeaways here from like from the web component spec is that you get true composition, right? Um, get actual elements you can use instead of uh, like virtual nodes or uh, or or just a jQuery object or anything like that. Um, and you're relying on low-level platform APIs. Um, so this is stuff you know, just like we have uh, Angular scope uh, applying this uh, scope styling, right? You don't need to do that here. The uh, like the APIs take care of it. The browser take ca takes care of it. And that's all good, but what about browser support? We're pretty lucky here because Chrome, Safari, and Firefox are fully supported now. Uh, Edge is working on it now, so it's in active development on the Shadow DOM and the custom element spec. Um, so you still require polyfills for these now. And same goes for IE11. You can actually use them in, uh, in versions below IE11 as well, but like with all these new APIs you're using, uh, there's probably not you're probably going to fill up the browser with polyfills at that point. So I would advise not to use them for anything below IE11, even though you could with polyfills. Um, so that's basically it now, right? We, we know we can use it in our browsers right now. We've seen how it all works. Um, but that's not a good developer experience, right? We're used to like Angular CLI, the Vue CLI, and we're used to having this templating languages and stuff like that. Um, so uh, that's the flavor part of my talk, right? What are we going to go into here? Uh, I put names on them, <laughs> just so people could understand. Uh, some of the, uh, everyone should probably know Vue.js. We have Polymer in the middle. That's an old school player in this field, actually. Uh, I think if you use YouTube, it's built on Polymer Elements, and it's quite old already. Um, then we have Angular Elements, which is an Angular package uh, for creating web components. Skate.js, which is more over in the React world, has different renderers. Uh, it's pretty cool as well. And we have Stencil.js from the Ionic team, who was primarily an Angular team, actually, and have uh, recently gone out and, like, you know, they want to break away from all the frameworks and just be sort of, like, in the middle. Uh, and we're going to go into, like, how can you, as Angular developers, use this right now, right? So first, we install Angular Elements, the package. Then we create our component. And then we register it, like, as a custom element, right? That, that's the steps we need to go through. And installing it is pretty easy. If you're using the CLI, you can do ng-add, Angular Elements, uh, and it will set up the package for you, and it'll also include some, some, some polyfills for you. Uh, or you can do it, uh, depending on your project, right? You can just install it, uh, npm install it as well. Uh, 
at that point, you would have to like look into this uh, to the polyfills yourself. And there are different versions out there for you to use. Then we need a component, right? So this is a, a simple Angular component here. We have a, a, a class, we have an input of a placeholder. Um, and as you've seen, I've actually commented out the selector. And that's because we're not going to use the selector or, or we're trying to avoid naming conflicts um, because we're going to register our Angular component um, as a web component. And as you saw before, when we do the custom elements define, that's where we actually give it its tag. Uh, one could say that you know it could be pretty cool if Angular just did this, and maybe they'll do that at some point, but they, they don't now. Um, and then we have to sort of go into the next step. So this is out in our ng module, right? We include our components in our declarations and in our entry components, right? This is where, because Angular sort of needs to know, I need to be aware of this component, but I don't need to bootstrap it directly. Um, then in the module, we use this create custom elements function, and this custom create custom elements function actually comes from this Angular elements package uh, as part of that. Uh, it takes your component, uh, and then uh, and this options uh, object where you can uh, apply the injector, say if you're using your dependency injection in, in, uh, in your code. Uh, and then we call the standard from the browser, custom elements define, and this is where we apply the tag and our class, the class we get from create custom elements. And so what Angular actually does here in create custom elements is that it sort of binds the custom elements like the lifecycle hooks there to the lifecycle hooks on your Angular components. So it self bootstraps. Uh, and every output you have on your Angular component, uh, they are being bound as uh, custom events as well. So like you can use them in every, uh, everywhere in the DOM. Uh, and inputs as well get uh, placed as properties um, so, so that you can basically just use it in the DOM. And it, looks lo something like this when we use it, right? We have our multi-select and we have a placeholder. And this could have been just like any other Angular component, right? The only thing is that with this, we could use it everywhere outside Angular as well. Um, <laughs> and that's the next thing. What about outside Angular? Because uh, I spoke to some, uh, some here before as well, like, but the bundles are really big, right? Because you're bundling a lot of Angular with it. And that is very true right now. Uh, and I think they are aware of it themselves. Uh, this will hopefully change with the new Ivy renderer coming around. I know they've talked about like, like the size and, and how they can bring this down. But if you really want to try and see and use this outside Angular, there are tools out there. Manfred Steyr built this NGX build plus, which is actually has uses uh, outside of these Angular elements as well basically means that you can uh, you can extend the Webpack config that is sort of hidden with the Angular CLI, so you can extend that and do some custom things with it. Uh, example here is that uh, you could define some of the packages to be external, like Angular and stuff like that, if you had that globally, uh, to uh, decrease your bundle size. Um, so that's sort of one tool you could use to, to bundle it outside of Angular. On the note of that, I wouldn't really use them outside Angular right now. And I know that's like we're talking about web components in Angular, and I really want you to start using them, right? But hopefully Ivy will change this. But say in your Angular apl applications, you could still get a lot of benefit out of these because they're self-bootstrapping. So say you have a, um, an application where users can input stuff like in a CMS, like you know, with their rich text editors and stuff like that. You could put uh, an Angular element, because it's a tag, just directly in there, and it will self-bootstrap. Um, we used to, in AngularJS, right, we could parse content and we could compile the components live in the browser, but you, that's ill-advised in, in, in Angular, right, to, to do this. But with these self-bootstrapping components, it gets a lot easier. Um, as an example, uh, I have a client where we have this dashboard, and they have, like, multiple applications um, they can access from this dashboard. And each application has, like, a widget or, uh, or like, a little key stat area that they, they can fill data into. But say, you know, one customer don't have, th they only have four apps out of eight active and the other has all eight. So there's no use, uh, there's, there's no idea for me to load all that code in the, uh, in the dashboard. So what I did was we compiled them as, uh, like, the widgets as Angular elements. Uh, and then we lazy load them if they have the applications active uh, as well. So, so we don't like have all this code up front, but we only load them when the customers need them. Uh, in this uh, example, when they have the applications active. Um, so that's, uh, that's one use case for them. And, and of course, it, depending on what, uh, what uh, components you have out there, but building like a multi-select in there and then creating it as an Angular element, that just sets you up for the future, right? So, so if this whole thing with the uh, Ivy makes them small enough for you to just dis distribute them in other frameworks, then, then there you have it. That's a pretty good use case. On to view, 
I'm not a Vue developer myself, so, <laughs> so this is stuff I read up on. I think it's pretty cool uh, because Vue actually aligns pretty well with the spec, right? We create our component, our view file, and our view file is not that different from the file I showed before with the template, the styling, and, and the JavaScript code directly in one file, right? Uh, so they work really well with this. And then you just export it uh, via the CLI. And it looks a little like this. There's CLI, build, target, web component. Give it a name and an entry point. And it does the exact, oh, not exact same thing, but something equivalent to what Angular Elements does, right? It binds up the, uh, the, the event handling from view to the custom element and sets up the lifecycle hooks and, and, and all that sort of inputs and outputs, uh, outputs to uh, events as well. Um, and then to use that, it Vue sort of has the same problem as Angular, right? That even though you can build these web components, they still rely on Vue.js. So we sort of we still have to have Vue in there uh, and a, a polyfill if you need that. Uh, and then your custom element, and you can use it directly in DOM as well, um, just like the Angular one. Um, what Vue has going for it though is that it's a lot smaller upfront than Angular is. So so there's more use ca use cases here. It's a little like I think it's less than jQuery, right? And we have jQuery everywhere still probably. A lot of people have them. Um, and now we're going to go into another one here, Stencil. Uh, I mentioned uh, all the ones before. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I don't have uh, I don't have knowledge of all of them, but they're pretty cool. Actually, if you want to look into uh, into Polymer uh, with their new uh, 3.0 version, like Lit Element and Lit HTML, which I know Philip has talked a lot about. Indeed, <laughs> yeah, it's probably on YouTube, right? So people can go watch it. Uh, but that's really exciting. The tag template literals. Um, but uh, but since uh, Stencil was, uh, I think they released it, uh, like they revealed it last year, actually at the Polymer Summit in Copenhagen, um, where they talked about it. Right, this this uh, this is the people behind um, behind Ionic, which is a, uh, a what do you call it, uh, a hybrid mobile app development, right, for for building applications for. Uh, for iPhones, for uh, for Android, um, uh, together with Cordova, right, to to get native uh, native access, um, and they built this huge like framework around this. Um, but Angular was getting pretty heavy in that they didn't really use that much of Angular, um, so they set out to look into this web components part, and they built Stencil, which is a compiler, uh, much like what Polymer does as well. Um, so so they compile down to 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 native web components with a very tiny runtime. Uh, Stencil uses TypeScript and JSX, so TSX files. As Angular developers, I probably a lot of you don't like JSX. I don't know or if you've had any experience with it, but I know there's uh, <laughs> not. It's not for everyone. Um, they have simple lazy loading built-in. This lazy loading that we're actually struggling a little with in, in Angular is built in here, uh, and it runs on this async rendering pipeline as well. So it's pretty performant. To get started, npm init Stencil, at least if you're using npm version six or over. Um, which will just uh, fetch the component starter from GitHub and get you started. And this is a stencil component. And if I didn't tell you it was a stencil component, it looks a lot like Angular, right? Some of you might be like, okay, this is just Angular, uh, except for like a few of the decorators here. Uh, and that probably stems from, from the, <laughs> the Ionic team from Angular. They really love this. They love the decorators and everything in there. Um, so we have the component decorators. We have element decorators here to get the, the host element as your web component, right? Uh, props for properties instead of inputs. Um, uh, where it differs a little is this render method. So people coming from React will know this uh, as well, where we just return some JSX here. So this is HTML directly in JavaScript uh, with types. And I got a little teaser from uh, from the uh, from the dev team uh, at Stencil that they're building on. Um, work in progress, disclaimer. Um, but this, and I know Hello World, is not the best like like uh, like view on, on on how you build applications, right? But we're talking about a Hello World uh, component here, broadly compressed at like 250 bytes. So that's pretty good for performance, right? And they have a runtime around six kilobytes that re includes the the render as well. So I think we're getting there compared to, to some of the sizes we've seen, especially if you're trying to uh, bundle out Angular components. And that's sort of what I had. So are there any questions in relation to anything uh, I've talked about here? Anyone? So with the scope CSS in web components, uh, one way to get around it is to use CSS custom properties. So 
native CSS variables. Yes. So you can allow customizing some parts yeah. of the styling of your web component. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, I want to mention that Ivy will probably not be in Angular before at the earliest uh, version 9 of Angular. Uh, Igor Minot uh, said that in Angular Connect. Um, <coughs> so that's a bummer for web components. <laughs> Both yes, no, yeah. yeah. Uh, and about the, the lazy loading you mentioned, uh, yep. it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not there yet in Angular, it's not, you have to go through the router. Yeah, that's so correct, yeah. Change that as, as well. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Support yeah. Uh, dynamic <coughs> import statements yes. for lazy loading, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool, and that's definitely going to help, that's correct, yeah. Yeah? Uh, is there a, a limit uh, of the complexity of uh, web components? In what term? <laughs> well, uh, you, you, you showed a monster selection. That, that's not exactly a, a, a complex uh, element. That's correct, yeah. Um, state selector is a bit more complex. Is, a, is there a, an upper limit, or is it just? Uh, it's like what we do with, with, with Angular, right? You could put like an entire date picker in one component if you wanted to do that. Yeah, Your yeah. web component could also have, you know, web components inside of it, of course. Um, I don't know if there's any upper limit. I don't think so. It's really about what you build. But of course, if you want to keep you know, a size down, that's one thing. And um, web components, because you can use them like everywhere across the boundaries, right? you have to think about how people use them a little more than, you know, if you build an Angular component, you know it's probably going to be used within Angular. Yeah. And you have these constraints, right? But with a web component, it can be you know, used just directly in the DOM. So, so you have to sort of think like, what is your public API on your component? Uh, so, so I definitely wouldn't build overly complex components directly as for components unless they had a specific purpose uh, and a well-defined API. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Great. Just remember, be responsible. And this is actually, and it, this covers uh, components as, as a whole, right? I, I mentioned the multi-select and date pairs and stuff like that. But what I'm thinking about here is accessibility. Because when you're building web components, you're introducing these new DOM elements out in the world, right? And like, don't try and create a new button. Like, just use the button that's there. It's very accessible and it works in the browser, right? Uh, and if you really have to do something that, you know, sort of mimics a, a, a native control of any kind, then just remember to make it accessible and make it usable because, you know, that's going to improve your adoption rate of, of your components out there. And then analyze key candidates for web components in your projects. Now, you might have some, you know, some, 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 um, some candidates already that you can start working on. And then start building with the platform, not necessarily just on it, just use it. So you mentioned, uh, <coughs> sorry, you mentioned buttons. Yep. Uh, does this syntax where you say button is my button, does that work now? Um, it it's not discarded, but Safari has said they're not going to implement it. So there's no use in doing it. But that's correct. You could actually extend uh, built-in elements uh, and, and use those. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to start using it because it's probably never going to end. Yeah. Actually, the guy behind the polyfill uh, document register element has it in there somewhere. Like He's very big on keeping it small and backwards compa compatible. Um, but that's a whole other talk. But yeah, but yeah, that's correct. You could, uh, you could extend it. Yeah. If you only use Chrome, you could use it now <laughs> if you wanted to do that. But uh, I don't know who, uh, who can say that to their customers. Don't use anything else. It's the only way sure. Great. Excellent. Give it up. That's what I have. <laughs>